afternoon, and welcome to the 93rd episode of the Veritas Fact Finding Series. And this morning, I'm joined by my good friend, John Ruffalo. Good morning, John. Good morning, Anthony. Surfacing facts and revealing truths is a never ending quest for us at Veritas. In each episode of the Fact Finding Series, we go on the ground to speak to industry professionals in an unscripted, candid, live video format to discover how we can make better investment decisions. In this series and in everything we do, we believe the facts empower investors and that better information leads to better investment decisions. By way of background, my name is Anthony Shilapati. I'm the president and CEO of Veritas, which is an independent equity research firm based in Toronto, Canada. We're just celebrating now in our 23rd year, 100% employee owned and operated. Quick note here, this broadcast is not to be taken as investment advice and participants or employees of Veritas group of companies may own the securities discussed in this broadcast. While I love all our guests and John in particular, this session may contain forward looking statements, investment opinions and comments that we may or may not agree with. Now, there, if I, John's resume, you know, extends two pages and I know this is- Yeah, don't short. read it. This is, this is even short, short form. Um, I'm going to give you the, the, the Shilapati version. I've known John in my entire career uh, as an accountant when I started at Arthur Anderson 94. Uh, John was one of the, I think at the time you were a manager. You mm -hmm. went on uh, to become a partner at Arthur Anderson. You then transitioned to Deloitte. Uh, where when you were at Deloitte, you not only became a partner there, uh, but you headed up their technology, their global, you were their, their global thought leader, global tax leader, Canadian industry leader, and for their technology, media and telecommunications pra uh, um, practice, and a member of their board of directors. You then transitioned that knowledge and expertise and went to go work at, at Omer's. And there you were the co-founder and vice chair of the Council of the Canadian Innovators. And you led um, the uh, Omer's Ventures, which you uh, started, started as well, and uh, raised and invested over $500 million in over 40 disruptive technology companies across North America, including uh, names that were much larger than they are today, like Shopify, Xanadu, and the list goes on, Hootsuite, et cetera. But I think what's most, most interesting, and I don't know if it's most interesting, but just when I think back, so uh, John was one of our first guests when we had the Fact Finders uh, launched in uh, just as the pandemic was getting started in March, April of 2020. And John joined us uh, in and around mid to late April, 2020. And we had a certain view uh, that we discussed about what might materialize for the technology sector, the markets in general, and especially private equity. And then, um, as many of you know, have been following the papers and, and the media news, uh, John suffered a, a tremendous accident in, uh, in September of 2020, uh, which he has overcome uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that uh, you know, marvels and, and is inspiring to everyone. So what we're gonna discuss today is we'll go through uh, John's story of his last two years um, and he started, uh, while all this is going on, of course, uh, John doesn't sit still. It doesn't matter how slowly he can move. He's moving. And I love the name of the new, the new, the new venture, Mavericks, where it ends in an X. Um, well done with that. Uh, but he started now in his own private equity firm focused on techno technology enabling growth and disruptive investment strategies. And, and he's raised $500 million and is set to put that in motion. John, thanks for being on the show. Great. Well, thank you very much, Anthony. So, John, why don't you take us back to the last two years as you see them, um, sprinkle in that uh, your own experience, and um, we'll have a great discussion. Sure. Well, let me start first on the business front and the economic front, which is what you know most of your uh, uh, listeners are, are, are probably more interested in. We could talk about kind of what happened in, in the middle of all that. So, Anthony, you know, you and I have chatted so much uh, over uh, the years, and you know, one of the things that I admire what you do, and where we're very much aligned is as an investor. I do think it's most important to understand the the macroeconomic environment, and I think that too many investors reverse it. They look at the micro first, and then they justify a micro individual investment 
to, you know, any select macroeconomic as opposed to the other way around. And why is that important? Uh, in that, I think it's really important to understand long term cycles so that you understand the entry point of your investments so that you can make a sufficient return from an exit uh, perspective. This is true in public markets as well as private. And, you know, one of the things that I was noticing, and it was really through my journey as, uh, you know, running Omer's Ventures was I started building Omer's Ventures in 2011 at the beginning of the investment cycle. And, and it was amazing. And I get to say to you, it didn't take a lot of brains to make a lot of money. It just took more guts to do it when others were still running away. But it was just phenomenal entry points. The, the, the party was already over in 2015, and you could see it. Now, what did you see? You started seeing two different cycles occur. The one cycle was the technology cycle that actually started around 2008 <clears throat> was starting to mature and crossing the chasm to traditional industries. So the whole technology enabled world started to occur and we didn't know what to call it. So we just called everything FinTech, health tech, prop tech, whatever tech. They weren't tech companies. They still aren't tech companies. These are traditional businesses that are powered by tech. I'm gonna come back to that thesis, but that started for real around 2015. What also started around 2015 was the significant increase in capital funding the technology segment. And I started to sniff the, it wasn't quite overly funded, but the quality deal flow started to flatten in the first time of four years, number one, but the entry points started to increase and increased noticeably. It wasn't until 2017 where the increase became, holy crap, we have a very significant mismatch of the supply of capital compared to the demand for quality investments. So it was in 2017, and I think, Anthony, I spoke at one yeah. of your conferences, and I said, oh, oh, people, be That's really correct. careful now. We're starting to hit an apex here. And I actually think that was the real apex. Now, what was happening on a macroeconomic perspective, and, and there's lots of things, but I'm just going to tell you a couple of key ones. Number one, in terms of population demographics for first world nations, by 2020, the, you're, you were starting to see the massive retirement of the baby boomers. And why is that? Go back 65 years, 1955 was the peak year of baby boomers. And you extrapolate 65 years and all of a sudden you're going to start to see a shifting of people's deployment of, of, of risk appetite into savings because they had to. And you also see a corresponding decrease of consumerism because people tend to save yeah. you know, in their retirement. And so I had tagged 2020 as the year commencing the implosion of the world economy based on population demographics. But there was one key thing so remember I said to you 2017 was the time when I was like, uh-oh. Yep. It was being masked by the U.S. Fed with their bond buying program and the artificial decrease of interest rates to basically near zero levels. And what this did is it extended the runway for the party and it extended it to 2020. So when I then spoke, so that thesis, I'd say, was hardwired from my perspective around 2017. But when I came to speak at your, at, at, at this- One of your uh, conferences, in, yeah. Yeah, it was April, 2020. What I had said in there is, it's going to happen in the second half of 2020. I was quite convinced of it. 
except one big thing happened, the pandemic came. And that threw everything out the window, but temporarily. And this is where I, I, I was saying, if people were paying attention to a lot of the thoughts that I was sending out, the pandemic did not change a thing. It just either did a couple of things that act like an accelerant, particularly from a technology perspective, uh, trends that were already apparent there, instead of something, you know, say an e-commerce trend happening over a five to seven year period, it happened over a five to seven week period. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the fact that we're speaking right now on video conferencing, yeah. it was already leaning this way, but People were really reluctant. Now, all of a sudden, overnight, people said, we, we have no choice and it's not so bad. So that happened. And then the US and Canada and other countries continued to fuel the economy by, by uh, adding unprecedented stimulus and maintaining zero rates. So where, where, what, what's really happened is, and then, uh, Anthony, uh, I think you saw it in, uh, in October of 2021, uh, we actually wrote a thought piece saying, okay, now as the stimulus is going to get pulled back, and then we, we modeled a 200 basis point increase in interest rates. And historically, if you're an old guy like me, you'd say 200 basis points is nothing. But when, when coming off zero. Rates, <laughs> of zero, that is a monstrous increase. So we modeled it. It 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 implied a forty three percent complete reduction in the value of stocks. Forty three percent by a two hundred basis point increase. So if you were listening or reading what we're writing, what I was really saying is pull all of your equity to the extent that you can out of the public markets. And in our case, we did close our fund in April of 2021, and they waited an entire year, you know, with 500 million U.S. dollars, and did not deploy a cent, and was waiting for the implosion. And and the last thing I'll say, and then we'll we'll go back, is the market is not at cheap levels. It's reverting back to the long term mean, yeah. which was the mean up to around 2015. So if anybody says that valuations, oh, it's great, it's going down to 2019 levels pre-pandemic. No, 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 no. It's going down further because 2019 was already high valuations. 2020, 21 got stupid beyond imagination and the investors getting hit was just, it was just sheer stupidity in many cases, but, but there is a settling down that still needs to happen. We are clearly approaching the long-term mean, but if anyone thinks that this is a blip, it's not, it's just going back to normal. So I'll just pause there, Anthony. Okay, going back to normal, let's, let's because I think there's two markets uh, that are that are important to talk about here, and one is the public markets, which I think you spent a lot of time yeah. in your in your prelude here to to, to right. lay out the, the the game plan. But private equity has also been interesting during all this time, which you've been also playing in. Yes. So maybe you could overlay because I mean I'm you know great I'm not questions. I'm not going to take it, tell you I'm not going to give my view. Give us you know yeah, as a great result, question as a result of all this, private equity also played a role. And, and has been interesting. So take us yes, through that. Yes, you're going to see the rise of the private equity deployment in the next six, nine months. You're going to see some pretty monstrous amount of capital come out because during this whole craziness, so let's talk about the, the private markets and let's just separate the private markets into two categories. Good. Let's talk about the more traditional technology-based companies versus the rest of the market. Okay. In the technology-based markets, um, the long-term means, and let's just use SaaS businesses just, just as one example. Yep. The long-term mean is a three to seven times multiple 
afford revenues is the proxy for valuation with the outliers being you know, kind of the hyper growth companies at about uh, 10 times. So when I did Shopify in 2013, that was done. Uh, I actually had a heart attack. So I think we did it between, it was 10, 10 and a half times. And, and sales, or are we talking about EBITDA? Revenues. This is all revenues. revenues. Okay. This, is, this is the technology front. No, I, I have to just yeah. make it clear. Right, right. Because what EBITDA does, we're going to flip that shortly. Yeah. And so uh, during the pandemic, the average multiple was 20 times. This all is in the, the way, private space. Pardon? This is in the private space. In the private, 20 times ARR Ford for revenues was the average. And we were routinely getting 30, 40, 50. Our record was a hundred times. By the way, they were all financed. And, and here is where people have lost their minds and I have zero sympathy for it. Whenever you're doing a valuation on the private side, mm -hmm. you really should be using a three valuation model. The core is always DCF. If you're not doing DCF, you actually don't understand the business. And DCF is what gives you the purity of understanding, are those revenues possible based on the revenue model? And then once you do the DCF, you then compare it using a, you know, the, a comparable transaction model where recent transactions, or you use public comps. And, but those are used to kind of check, do a little bit of sanity checking, but the DCF is the purity. Why do I say this? Is that if people actually did a DCF and understood the intrinsic value of these businesses, they would not have been drunkenly stupid to do 50, 60, 100 times ARR multiples because you would have saw it was impossible for these businesses to actually do it. But, but it was predicated on the greater fool theory and it was, a, it was just a matter of time. So in the technology sector where it was most egregious was in the late stage venture market. So these are folks that are putting capital in, in largely technology companies at crazy values and they're really using public comps as their as their valuation marker, you know, on the basis that, well, this company is going to go public. So it's basically public anyway, but not realizing that the public valuations were egregious in and of, of, them, of themselves. And then as you go down the food chain, the valuation was less egregious as you got down to the seed levels, but they still were double the long-term mean the late stage valuations on average were triple the long-term mean and three, sorry, two thirds. This is, I think a 2020 stat or 20, I can't remember. Two thirds of all of the venture dollars were in late stage. So this is your Tigers, Kotu's, yep. uh, SoftBanks that lost their minds completely and were just everything you know, I think they just wanted to produce unicorns so that they could uh, say that. And so the earlier stages were just a reflection of what was happening up top. When you go to the private equity markets, which tend to be valued on an EBITDA basis, everything was expensive, no question. But uh, most of the stuff wasn't. Uh, implausible. Things were getting priced to perfection for sure, but it wasn't outrageous. But a lot of them sat on the sidelines waiting. And, and you know, some of the larger ones had no choice but to deploy capital. And, and it, it, it was a very tough environment. But what you're, you know, starting to see is the implosion of the private market first starting, it's already happened right now at the late stage. It has slowed down dramatically and everyone who you know, was foolish enough, foolish enough to invest at egregious values in 2020, 2021 
are licking their wounds because on average, on average, their portfolio is overinflated by 50% on average. Now, whether they admit it or not, yeah. most are not. Public, if you're a public hedge fund manager, you're taking it on the chin because you have no choice. And here is the funniest part. They took the valuations on the comps on the way up, yeah. but not take it on the way <laughs> down. Like it is bordering. They're, on they're only temporary. The, when the, when that goes down, it's only temporary, John. Come on. It's, oh, it's but hopefully they raise another fund. Hopefully they don't have to show it. Or or one legitimate way is if the company that they invested in was not burning cash ridiculously and they don't need another financing, then hopefully the future growth will will backfill the hole and your your IRR is just pushed out and it's decreased but it's, and your exits pushed out further that is the best case scenario but for the most part uh it's not showing up but it does show up you know historically about six to nine months with a lag and it will start off on the late and then it starts to cascade down all the way to the earliest stage investment. But remember, I said that the earliest stage was only double the long-term mean. So when they go down, they're not, relatively speaking, going down as much as the late stage ones. What are you going to see on private equity? And this is what our firm is doing. Yep. We always were looking for positive uh, uh, unit economics and ideally zero, no negative EBITDA. And in, in our first couple of investments that we just closed last month, both are highly EBITDA positive. And we, you know, we worked on those deals for quite a long time because we were just really, you know, concerned about the market implosion. What you're going to see is a lot of the private equity firms that were sitting on the sidelines, like we were, although going through everything, are now licking their chops. And you're going to see for the first time in a number of years, a lot of these companies that were public, there's going to be a lot of go privates. And already, we already had our first one uh, last month that we really strongly considered we, we, we're not going to do it, but, but they're coming uh, at a greater velocity. And you're going to see for the first time again, and it's been a, quite a while, um, you're going to see the down rounds, public down rounds. You already saw Klarna announce a very big down round, but it's a good company. Uh, but you're going to see cram downs for the first time. Oh, yeah. And lots of inside deals to avoid the cram downs. So this is where things get very, very interesting. Now, the shitty companies, frankly, they should not have been funded in the first place. Yeah. They just go away. But the good news on that is the employees, you know, you, you get more talent and the ones that were stronger will get stronger because they're going to get the good employees from the ones that are going to go away. And the ones that have a good business model, you watch, they're going to snap up, you know, maybe cheaper competitors. And when we come out of this thing here, there's going to be a lot stronger companies. So funny enough, this is going to be a time of the strongest companies are just going to get stronger. Lot to, lot to unpack there. Um, but what, what I, if I could maybe add some color that the public markets took off, um, as you pointed out, even in your own businesses, you saw things being expensive. You stayed on the sidelines for at least the, the more recent couple of years. I know many private equity firms that were just selling off investments. They were like, oh, yes. I can't, they were doing, telling me that they were getting multiples that they never, they hadn't even put them on their spreadsheet yes. when they first bought the deals saying, you're going to actually give me this money. Okay, <laughs> fine. Very the smart. smart. The smart ones were selling. Smart ones were selling. Many were actually, what was happening is individuals and family offices, high net worth, whatever it is, uh, even pension funds that hadn't considered private equity and it sat on their hands. They looked at what monies were being made and they said, I got to get into this mess. How come we've been sitting on our hands this long? So money poured in 
to yes. private equity in the latter part of the last decade and especially in the in the last couple of years. Last three years, 2019 was a big, big year for yeah. pension funds that were sitting on the sidelines. And to be honest, I warned them. Yeah. I warned them. John, you don't let, get you and I talked. When you left Omers, wasn't that 2017 or 2018? 2018, end of 2018. Yeah. And it was because, I mean, I don't know if you can say all the things now, but it was because you saw what was going on, not just how pension funds work and think, but also what valuations were there. And you're like, I, I, I can't I can't continue the yep. same uh, the same performance of what I've done in the last no, uh, should, six years. You should have sold the entire portfolio as fast as you can. And you're right. There you should have held on a couple more years, actually. <laughs> well, yeah, you know what? I would have sold early, but you know what? Then you got greedy, right? But I got to tell you, one of the top pension uh, private equity firm buyout firms in this country, I, I won't name them, but uh, one of the partners, a good friend of mine, and I just said, so what have you been up to? And he says, we are selling everything. And, it, and they're, this is a very well-known one. And I think they're down to like, an unbelievably low portfolio. It's yeah. like maybe it's the same so one that I follow. They're 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 clients of ours too. Oh, okay. Of them. There's and a lot sell, of smart money. They, yep, they've been a selling. lot of people. I get good smart people saw this happening, and you know when people are running, you know, you know the old adage of you know fear and greed drives yeah. the markets. It's so true. So when others are fearful you get greedy and when, and you know, you should, you should do the opposite. So, you know, so, so let's, so let's take us now where we are. So we've seen right. Public markets take off pri uh, private markets take off. Now you're starting to see some of these private equity firms. You're seeing the late stage ones. You mentioned the tigers that have been in the news where you've seen, started to see some implosions. There's quiet implosions taking place where mm -hmm. they haven't marked the market because they're still yes. friends with the auditors. Yeah. But that'll, that'll get set. That'll, that'll, that'll get, get settled. settled. It'll get settled. 12 yep. months or so from now. Yeah. 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 Um, when things become clear, but I, but what I'm, as I'm, you mentioned, I think I read between the lines that we're not done yet. We're not and, done yet. Okay. So why don't you take us from here where it's, it's now, you know, May 26th, let, let take us through the next, 12 months as you see them unfolding, if you can. I, I think that the markets are still going to be uh, uh, drifting downwards. Uh, certainly not at the levels, you know, what we saw right now, but uh, stocks are still not cheap from a historical perspective. Yeah, they're, they're, they're well valued, but here is the, here is where the problem is. And this is the part that I was worried about, which, yeah which I, I, I was hoping was not going to happen is I wanted interest rates to rise for the reasons that I expected, but I didn't want a recession to occur. And, you know, I, I, I now am up to, I don't know, a 20 to 30% chance that a recession will occur. And now here is the problem. Now you really don't have growth. You and so now reduce. So when I did the models, and again, anybody who wants to go back and look at a LinkedIn post that we did in October, we factored in uh, a decrease in market demand for your product. And we just used yeah. a, a proxy. It may not have been enough now. And if that is harder or, or a bigger recession than we think, then we are really going to drift down. And I think we're going to go into a market malaise, again, using historical. It doesn't go up into a V. It goes into this very long, I don't know, what do we call it? It's long U or whatever, or a, an L or whatever the hell you want to call it. So, so you're just going to have to be like, it's not all bad. But before, you know, people were, were investing in a market where all stocks were rising and people were confusing a cycle of all st stocks rising with, you know, your, your uh, intellect on selecting winners. It was all there. Okay. Now, and again, and I always, this is what I've learned over these, you know, 
in the long number of years in the market. <laughs> you're not as smart as you think you are, and you're not as stupid as the market thinks you might be either. You're somewhere in the middle, right? So when things went nuts like that, and people were marking up their book, and I loved it when you had some investors were talking about the number of unicorns that they magically had in their portfolio, despite the fact that they're the ones who set the valuation on the financing, which I found was so preposterous. Um, you know, you know, uh, like when that's happening, you really got to step back and go, whoa, I didn't, I, I you know, and, and so many people got, were saying, I can't believe the valuation of my businesses. And the smart VCs, particularly the earlier stage ones, they were participating in the secondaries. And it was interesting. They were trying to dump as much as they can. Yeah. And, and they were realizing that the valuations were beyond the intrinsic values. So it's the same thing now in that there will be stocks that will be oversold for sure because of the fear. And you know, some argue that Shopify is now oversold because it's it's multiple on a forward basis is actually uh, now uh, at, at a historical low. I, you know, there's arguments I, I, either way, but um, and 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 it could have been oversold because once somebody gets on top of the stock and they start running and and the the greed. Uh, sorry, the fear, the fear starts taking over. There will be some stocks on the public markets that are just simply oversold and it's a buying opportunity. However, what I'm also seeing is a lot of folks going, oh my God, this stock has dropped 50%. It looks so cheap. No, hold on just a minute. It was just so egregiously valued. Is it actually fairly priced? So the same exercise is going on in the private markets. And when I talk to private equity colleagues, the ones who are really watching this, they're waiting about six to nine months. They want to see where things are shaking out. And they also want to see entrepreneurs readjust their valuation expectations. Because right now it hasn't readjusted yet. The reality of where the market is has not filtered in the system yet. But that's why I say 2023 is going to be, I think, a very interesting year for deployment of capital, particularly by private equity, assuming that the, the recession is not a horribly bad one. Uh, and that's, again, that's the one thing that we're being very, very mindful and watching very closely on. So I, I think one of the things that we've talk, been talking about and, and with our clients is that really the aberration of, of the uh, pandemic um, did away with the trend, as you pointed out, that was happening in 2019. We already saw consumer insolvencies rising, commercial insolvencies rising, the economy slowing. Coming into 2020, the market was actually starting to get soft. I'm talking the stock market. Yeah, yeah. And then COVID happened. And of course, there was the big shock and the V recovery because of all the stimulus. You're right. This time we don't have that stimulus. No. Nope. And, and, and we're going, and it seems already, I mean, you just watch what happened with Walmart, what happened with Target. You're seeing come public, uh, you're seeing some of Snapchat, you're seeing Facebook, like yep. your big players that deal in consumer. Um, that their revenues have really missed, and therefore, of course, they're, they're so have their profits. So, if we end up having th this recession that you that you that you're anticipating, and, and I, I think we're on the same page there, um, what what sort of goalposts are you looking for that would make you say? Because you said you're hoping not a bad one. Let's say what yeah. sort of goalposts are you looking for, or indicators that would make you say, "Oh boy, this is a, a bit more of a holy shit." recession versus a you know we're going to come out of this pretty uh, okay yeah i mean uh i i i i think you know let's just use a technical recession sure uh you no know, i was just reading something yesterday and I, I and i hate to admit it but the person says i think that we're right in the middle of it and we just 
we just don't know it. The, the yeah. U.S. Q1 GDP was negative. Uh, right. It didn't make many headlines. It but... didn't. We're only one quarter away. Right. We're one quarter away from a technical recession. So, And to use your number, the, to go back to what you said, you thought the Fed was going to raise rates. How much has he raised rates? Right. We're, we're back at 1%. This is not a big deal. Yeah, not yet. They, they did. They did. They 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 have priced into the market about a 200 basis point increase. But but they're afraid. They're afraid, terrified that it's going to stoke the or ignite a recession. But I think we're ready in it. But the other shoe is inflation is ugly, and at these levels of inflation and 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 keeping your money in the bank, you're in the hole five six percent by just keeping your money in the bank so it, it it's 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 like this is a tough time um for for public investors i, I can tell you i'm happy to share it so i pulled out of the market um i, I could only pull out 80 i went 80 percent cash the other 20 percent were were my largely my I thought we were going to withstand a hit that were, they were largely banks, utilities and energy, but pretty much everything else I try to get uh, out. And uh, literally just yesterday, I've started my program to go back in very cautiously over the next six to nine months and looking at, um, you know, well, well, uh, you know, priced areas but but I'm going first into areas that 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 I believe uh, demand will be uh, 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 inelastic. Now you know you know the dollaramas, the safety thing in retail, the dollaramas or the WalMarts, you know for example. But you know the what the other thing I must say is that you know, we just closed our deal with an interesting company called Agora Brands. Oh yeah. And they are an aggregator of Shopify stores. There's a ton of aggregators on Amazon. Shopify is much more difficult to do because uh, of the way that uh, in Amazon does everything for you. Shopify does a best of breed and it's harder to operate on a uh, aggregator model. But here is the point. We did this exactly at the time when, you know, Shopify and everyone's going nuts and saying, oh my God, the business is cratering. But from what point are you talking? So uh, e-commerce sales, and again, who the hell knows, but e-commerce, uh, if you are a betting person, do you think that we'll be doing more e-commerce in the future, the same or less? I bet more. And in fact, if you, if, if you read consensus reports, there's still a compounded growth rate of 12% for e-commerce companies. The pandemic was generating 100% increases. So what I just said is if you go down 80%, going down to a growth rate of 20%, is that a bad company? No, just make sure you price it properly when you invest it. So, you know, to the folks that, that, that might be listening, still look at where the long-term trends are going. And again, making sure that your entry point is fair in going in and then allowing it to ride out. And why is that? Is that if, if, if we are in a technical recession, it typically lasts 18 to 24 months. This is why you're getting lots of pundits saying for the next two years, it's going to be kind of very flattish. And that's what I actually expect as well, too. And that is just in line with what's happened in the past. But if we see that earnings continue to come under pressure, uh, we could see uh, further downside in, in markets, right? I think so. Oh, I think it's, I think it's there. So if anyone, uh, if any of you have a question, uh, please hover over your, the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A, uh, type it in and I'll make sure here on my phone as I look down, I will uh, make sure to ask John uh, a question. And um, 
John, that you, you mentioned that you touched on uh, some areas. You mentioned Dollarama. I think thinking staples, right? Uh, items right. And, and, and businesses that are going to be there that have pricing power. There's utilities there. That, Correct. That utilities that. are great. They're um, great. We've done also. We've been we've been pushing the the, the commodity trade. I think that yes. uh, energy has yes. been very strong, and I think materials are going to continue uh, to be strong. Um, so that's that. Those are areas that 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 we see opportunity still. Um, I wonder if you could speak to tech to a degree. You you mentioned how you bought this. You guys bought this company in Agora, called Agora. Um, what sort of sectors or spaces within the tech space, if I could call it that, yeah. um, are you now sort of sniffing around or can you comment sure. there that might lead us to think about things within the public markets? Because look, we've seen some of these names, Zoom has been Zoom, Peloton's got flat tires, yeah. I mean, uh, and so on down the list, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So our, our thesis is, uh, you know, we avoided the classic technology companies, you know, whether it's software, hardware, semiconductor, because of the of the uh, ridiculous uh, valuations, and comparatively, we went into traditional five traditional industries. So, financial services, healthcare, uh, being you know two of the uh, five that uh, that had the greatest. Uh, tailwinds behind it, but also transportation and logistics. I think that's going to be a very, very important area, and even more so uh, with all of the supply chain issues around the world. Um, we have a future of retail, which is largely a future of e-commerce. And then the last one, it sounds like a catch-all, but it, we call it live, work, play, and learn. And what it is, is, you know, how we as humans interact with the physical world. And, you know, as one example, uh, smart cities, what, what will the, 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 the future look like from a smart city or smart neighborhood uh, perspective? In all five of these investment themes that we have, it is a traditional industry, but the disrupt, they have to have a disruptive element and they're all leveraging technology, but their product or service is not technology. Right. It is, you know, if it's financial service, it's a financial service. And one of the things that we saw that was being ignored is we like to back entrepreneurs who are experts in their particular field, but are enlightened enough to understand the power of technology. I, I compare this to a number of technology-based entrepreneurs who are outstanding at building a tech stack, but then they're trying to compete in a traditional industry where many of them have no clue, you know, how that industry really operates and where you see it is when that business starts to scale. And this is why so many of them had horrible unit economics because it's not just about technology, right? You better understand that business. You better understand if you're in a financial services business to understand what your net economic margin better be. And you better understand what your default rate might be in a recession, which by the way, for you know the buy now pay later as a great example, <laughs> It is shooting up the default rate, shooting up, and it's beyond the economic margin, right? This is why we avoided the space because we were I, worried about that. I, I love it. I think that you know, if I if I could characterize it, it's the the entrepreneur needs to needs to more understand the business, the industry, finding what kind of people are necessary to run that business, etc. Knowing how to program the code that's necessary to make it work sometimes becomes a, you tell me if this is right, can become a blinder because what happens yes. is we have such great technology. John, come visit me. I'm going to show you this thing can make coffee. You just push four buttons and it makes coffee. Right. Okay, but if you don't know how to run a coffee shop and what's going to make people come in the coffee shop, I don't care how fancy your tech works. You nailed, So let me give you a live example. You, you nailed it. Yep. Our first investment was a company called Viral Nation. It's a company a lot of people haven't heard, but 
it is huge already. And it's the leading, leading the, it's the world's leading social media influencer platform. Wow. And it's, and growing like stink. Um, when I first met with the folks and I understand this space quite well, I, you know, I backed Hootsuite and I, uh, you know, I, I've always stayed close to it. And I said, so what's your secret to success? And he's in the, the comment was, well, you know, we, they connect the brands to the influencers. And they said, we have the world's leading brands because they don't want to interface with technology. Mm-hmm. And I was like, really? And because I saw hundred of them that were all technology based, he goes, that's why we beat them all. Yeah. But then they also said, and I said, whoa, okay, I didn't understand that. But then the next sentence was, but we better make sure that our business is fully powered by technology so that when we're delivering that service, we are cheaper, better, faster, because a lot of times technology does disrupt you from underneath. But these two co-founders knew that business so well, and they knew what the brands really wanted, but they also understood, but we just can't run a business assuming that technology shouldn't be levered. So we're in, in part of our investment thesis, and you're going to see is you're going to have a harder time trying to figure out, are these, is Viral Nation a tech business or a marketing business? At its core, it's, it's a marketing business, but as time is going on, we're going to blur that on purpose, right? But we're coming from the expertise of the industry first and then bolting in the technology, not the other way around. And it sometimes works the other way around, but I would say that the market, for some bizarre reason, uh, valued uh, the valuations higher from the tech first approach. And the answer is it depends. And, And we're finding the entry points for valuations, not cheap, like nothing's cheap right now, but far more reasonable. John, very interesting. I, we didn't even get a chance to touch on um, what's happened to you since your accident in September. Sure. And I, I, I but I, I would really like to wrap up with that because I think it's it's something that that is really inspiring. Um, okay. You know, in September, you're riding your bike, uh, yeah. and uh, it, it it hit me too. My wife, you know, I showed my wife, and I, and she's like, "You got to stop riding." I told you, you're gonna get hurt. <laughs> and you were riding like up north, basically on on side roads that I, yep. I kind of ride on as well. Me too. Where where there because I don't want to be around any any cars. I actually don't ride my my bike to work. I don't ride it downtown. Yeah. Okay. If there's any cars around, I don't need to be there. And yet, I agree. You got so, hit by a semi. I, <laughs> so, I, I know. I, I got my hardcore rider, and um, all of my long rides are up north with all of my buddies. And um, but I'm paranoid of riding in the city because I just don't trust. I don't trust vehicles. Yeah. So the irony was, it was that because of COVID, when there wasn't any traffic, it was the first time. I started taking my bike from my place in the city and then riding up north because it was great. And I found a very safe way to get out of the city. And then once uh, I am north of the city, it's clear riding and in country roads. And I was near Stouffville and riding. And again, because of COVID, I'm riding by myself and it's midweek and I'm not riding with my buddies. And I've been doing the same or similar route for six months, gorgeous day, sunny, not a cloud in the sky. And the road that I use is relatively straight and it's not well, it's not treated so that people have uh, high visibility. The traffic does go at 70 kilometers an hour. And, you know, I was, I, I, I hug the roads and are the, the, the right sure. side of the roads and, you know, n- no, you know, I'm a very experienced writer. And this one particular day, as I was anticipating commencing the close of my fund, that was, you know, that's the other thing. My fund closing was going to start in October of 2020. And now this is September of 2020. And I'm getting all excited. And um, 
out of nowhere, I hear the screeching of a tire. Uh, and I knew it was a, an 18 wheeler. And to be honest, and Anthony, you've probably done this as well too, is just like what your wife said, the number of drivers that have no clue what to do with cyclists around, uh, I just thought it was another idiot who's right on my back tire. And I'm telling you, I was, I was, I was furious. It was like, who is on my back tire? Because I'm going to punch this guy in the face uh, because it's dangerous. And before I had time to react, it uh, hit me in the back. And I felt that, uh, which, you know, was unbelievable feeling, uh, flew through the air. And the worst part is, well, see, worst parts, lots of worst parts. There's lots of worst parts. The hitting of the back obliterated my vertebrae and uh, uh, obviously damaged my spinal cord, which led to my paralysis. Um, but then the hitting of the ground that I got hit at 80 kilometers, at least 80 kilometers an hour which the, the reason why you, you may not know of anybody else who got hit at 80 is because they're dead. Um, but I hit the ground with such force. It literally shattered uh, the right side of my body and my pelvis was shattered into six pieces. Um, won't go through all the details, but the, the two worst injuries and all my organs were, were, were thrown to one side of my body um, but the two worst things that happened is I did lose half of my blood. Um, and, uh, I had all of my ribs were broken on my right side of my body in multiple places. And what happens, it created a flail. And what that means is a section of my ribs popped out from my ribs where they're normally located. And why is that important? Well, as you breathe in, your ribs go in, but the flail goes out. And then as you exhale, um, your ribs go out, but the flail comes in. So uh, everyone doesn't understand why I didn't suffocate to death. And that, was, that should have been the way that I, I would have passed away. And the doctors don't understand, but... I, I woke up a, a minute or two later after being hit. I knew I was paralyzed. Um, and I didn't know that I was dying at the time. And uh, they got me into a hospital uh, in 25 minutes, which if I didn't get there within the first hour, I probably would have died uh, uh, where, where I had laid. But I was awake to the whole time. Uh, uh, to the journey to, to the hospital. And, uh, and then uh, they, they induce, a, a, I wouldn't say I was in a coma, but they induce a coma like state when they're intubating you in order to, to uh, uh, calm me down because they uh, could not perform surgery on me. They thought that um, it would kill me. It would be in the third trauma. And they actually, uh, as, as the CEO of the hospital said to me, we expected you to die and we wanted you to die peacefully. And I said, what was the odds of me surviving? And, he, and I didn't know this. And he said, uh, I told one of your friends that it was one in a million chance of getting past the first 48 hours. And I did. And guess what they did? They then had to, then, then they, then they performed <laughs> surgery on you. And I got performed surgery 36 hours after the accident, only to wake up four days later being told that I'll never ever walk again. So where, where did it go from there? Well, uh, you, you know the story. I, uh, uh, after being in, uh, I was in rehab hospital and hospital for four months, and I started continuing my fundraise. And this is Canada for you. Do you know that every single investor said, we'll wait for you to get out of hospital? And they did. Yep. And then when I got out of hospital in January, we commenced the closing, which led to the closing in April, which like, this is Canada, man. Like it's, it's, it's quite, quite unbelievable. And, you know, today, um, you know, I am, I am back on my bike. Uh, I, I'm on the Peloton. I'm back up to about 23 kilometers an hour on the Peloton. And then, uh, you know, outside I have a recumbent bike. Um, 
uh, on the weekend, I you know, rode uh, approximately 25 kilometers to my favorite coffee shop. And I could probably back to do about 50 kilometers uh, riding. Uh, it's bizarre. I cannot walk independently, but I can ride my bike. I don't, at, don't ask me yeah. how, because I don't know. And then my walking is improving every day. Uh, I do have a walker. Um, I do walk with, uh, using one cane. Uh, or a, a hiking walking stick and I'm building my body to walk with two sticks. And if I can do that, I can get out of a wheelchair. And I, you know, and, you know, again, the doctors told me that I'll never walk again. And, you know, to be honest, uh, I, I, I will repeat what I didn't say to them, but my wife was there. I said, go fuck yourself. Uh, <laughs> uh, don't tell me that I'm not going to walk, but I was terrified. So today I, uh, I do, you know, about 20 ish, maybe 30, but sort of there uh, hours of physio every week. And it's, uh, it's a lot of work, but, uh, I am determined, uh, I'm determined to get to back to walking at least independently. I do have two braces on my, below my knees. I don't have any mobility, uh, below my knees, but what is so bizarre I didn't realize that you don't need your legs below your knees to walk. You need your quads, your hams, and your glutes to walk. Your feet and ankles is what balances you. Right. And so hence what the poles are for and the braces are for. So that's the update. John, tell me if you had to give um, a synopsis of what it is that drove you. What, what, what made you tell you know you're lying there you can't move you you've just uh, you're coming out of consciousness probably at some you know in and out yeah, and yeah. in this recovery and they said look you're never going to walk again and you said fuck you well yeah. what what is what's kept you motivated what's kept you driving all this time to get back to where you were before um i'd say uh, there, there's a few factors I, i'd say the first one when i was lying on the ground dying i didn't know i was dying but uh the first thing that came in my mind was my was my kids and i just thought there's no way that you know i'm going to you know allow my kids to know that their dad died this way so that was number one and i'd say that is always the the continuing uh you know, impetus of your, your kids, your wife, uh, or your husband, whatever the case may be, it, it is really about your family and the friends that you'll leave behind. So that is first and foremost. But number two was, um, it, it, there is a stubbornness that, um, you know, I had a three, when, when I moved from Deloitte to Omer's, I, I developed a three part plan on how to reinvigorate you know, capital in this country. And I felt that I only achieved two of the three. And the third one was really in this growth private equity space. That was a real hole here. And I, and I felt like I didn't complete the mission as well. And that's the part when I was in hospital that I had to think, you know, could I have retired? Absolutely, it could have. But I would have felt a hollow retirement to be honest and and felt that goddamn you know maybe five years from now i'd look back and go why did i why did i bail out when i wasn't done and and that was that was the reason of continuing in on the fund and i'm, I'm glad uh that that i have it's not easy but but i'd say those those two factors combined that were really the driving force awesome Congratulations, John, on, on your continued success and uh, your recovery. And uh, who knows, I gotta, I'm going to bug you. We're going to go riding one day. Absolutely. Like a good idea. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. I'm, well, thank I'm going to ask you one last thing. I like to always ask my guests uh, favorite book and uh, if there's any podcasts that you follow. Um, so podcast I follow, uh, I love Smartless. Have you seen that? No. Oh, my God. It's funny. It's uh, Jason Bateman, um, uh, 
uh, the guy from Will and Grace, uh, one of the actors there, I forget. Okay. The guy's name. Anyways, it is one of the funniest podcasts that, that you would see. So whenever my wife and I go up north to our place there, we, we listen to it religiously, but it is a great uh, podcast. In terms of um, the book that I'm reading right now, uh, I'm actually have it right here. I don't know if you've ever seen this. It is a book that I've read before and needed to read again. It, you, know, you can't see that. It's called Silent Spring, Rachel Carson. It is the Bible that is used by every environmentalist that really, I think it was done in the early 60s, that really launched the environmental movement. And this woman basically predicted everything that we're seeing today if we don't do something. And you know, I remember when I first read it, it was David Suzuki who told me that's the first book that you have to read and uh, just decided to uh, to read it again. So uh, 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 highly recommended. All right. Thanks, John. Um, Thank you. I'm going to just launch our, our, uh, our polls uh, here and uh, people can just give us a quick uh, reading on how great you did and give us ideas for for our next podcast and we'll just let that sit john thanks for being part of us uh, of the event sharing your wisdom and keep it up great thank you very much thanks anthony i appreciate it okay bye-bye